Good morning, everyone. We are reading in Book 2, the Book of the Traveller of the Worlds, and Canto 4, the Kingdoms of the Little Life. And this, uh, this canto has six sections in it. Uh, we are in the middle of the fifth section. We're on page 143. And I think we stopped on line 419, which is very near the bottom, almost the bottom of the page. The... Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. It was me who gave the wrong one. So, Prasad has given me the wrong information. <laughs> tell us of the course. right information. <laughs> tell us the right information, please. I don't know the right <laughs> We're on page 144, and maybe we are just read the first sentence. So let us go back to the bottom of page 143, where it says, line 420, these felt lives quiver in the outward touch. These are beings who wear a human form, but who are not fully human. That's uh, what Shrobindo is telling us about now. So, um, Franz, will you start, please? These felt lives quiver in the outward touch. We could not feel behind the touch of the soul. Regard their form or self from nature's arm to enjoy and to survive for all their care. The narrow horizon of their days was filled with things and creatures that could help and hurt. The world's values hang upon their little self. Isolated, cramped in the vast unknown, to save their small lives from surrounding death, they made a tiny <coughs> circle of defense against the siege of the huge universe. They preyed upon the world and bear its prey, but never dreamed to conquer to be free. Thank you. So these beings have a human form. They're not fully human, but they, there is some mind operating in them a kind of animal mind that uh, hunts and fled and sniffed the winds or slothed inert in sunshine and soft air. It sought the engrossing contacts of the world but only to feed the surface sense with bliss. So this is all a, a very surface kind of awareness. So the narrow horizon of their days, of these first um, beings in a human form, what they are seeing, what they are aware of, is things and creatures that could help them or that could hurt them. The world's values, what they thought was good or bad, useful, it just hung upon their little self, their small beings, isolated, but they join together, they huddle up close together, cramped in the vast unknown to save their small lives from surrounding death. They made a tiny circle of defense. They grouped together to protect themselves against the siege of the huge universe. These beings preyed upon the world and the world preyed upon them, but they didn't have the capacity to look at all into the future. They never dreamed that they could conquer and be free. Bon. Of animal desire, 
Thank you. Anybody would like to ask anything about these lines? Oh, I'm sorry. It sounds like the chimpanzees that we have today in the uh, African jungle. But he says they have a human form. So these are the first human groupings. No? The world powers? Yes, the world power. I think this is nature, no? Mother nature. They have to uh, follow the hints that she gives them. And if they find, they notice that there's something that nature uh, punishes or says no to, they have to obey that, those taboos, you know? And they're only able to draw a very small uh, benefit, a little bit, from all the rich store of nature. The society, their group, not the nature. I beg your pardon? The of course, the... Uh, the world what, they, what, what they turn into taboos depend on their perception of nature. It's not coming from within. That's what Shobindo is saying. They're just living on the surface. You know? They're reacting to nature. There's no conscious code. It's not that they, they, this is a society where uh, certain um, ideals have been established. You do this and you don't do that. There's no conscious code, no life plan. But it's just the patterns of thinking of a little group fixed, a traditional behaviors, law, customs. And it's probably different from group to group. In small group, each of them, they have their, uh, their traditional ways of doing things. Yes. Um, this is not necessarily a description of evolution, is it? It's more like a, a description of a, a level of consciousness that exists. Well, this level of consciousness certainly exists, mm -hmm. but there was a time when it was uh, the dominant level of consciousness. So we are talking about <coughs> parallels? Yes. These kingdoms, little life that he's describing, they are steps in the development of our life. So this, uh, they, they are ignorant of soul. They may have some kind of feeling that there's some kind of ghost or something within, but they, they are not really aware of the soul. And their life is very habitual, tied to a mechanism of unchanging lives and to a dull, usual sense and feelings beat. They turned in grooves of animal desire. These beings have a, um, a human form, but it's basically still an animal consciousness. And all this is still in us, but at that time it was uh, just the highest level that consciousness had reached in, the stage of, uh, in, in that stage of evolution. And he's going to give a very vivid description of, of it, which we can recognize, I think. Um, uh, Mariage, would you read? Thank you. So well, this is quite a familiar picture, no? Where they have their, their walled villages where they work and they, they make war with the next door village with their banded selfishness joining together out of self-interest. They may sometimes uh, do something good. They may decide to 
um, plant some fields and work on them together, or also out of that banded selfishness, they, um, they would war with the next village and uh, they wrought a dreadful wrong and cruel pain on sentient lives, lives that are like their own. And they don't think that they're doing anything wrong. It's just natural to them. You know? Maybe, well, anything they do is right. No? <laughs> no, they have a conception of wrong because they have these taboos. But um, what they do is, is right. No? So then there's this very vivid picture which we, we can recognize. No? Ardent. They're just burning with the enthusiasm after sacking, destroying happy, peaceful homes. And they're gorged, they're just full up with their enjoyment of slaughter, plunder, rape and fire. They made of human selves their helpless prey. They're just like predators in their, um, they're powerful in their group and they're just uh, preying on their neighbors. They would capture um, other human beings, take them as slaves, a life of lifelong war, or they, they catch some hapless people and torture them just for fun, made it a spectacle and holiday, mocking or thrilled by their torn victims' pangs. And then they think they're just wonderful, they are so powerful, like titans and gods. Yes, these things are still going on, yes. So, proudly they sang their high and glorious deeds, how great we are now, and praised their victory and their splendid force. They're very uh, pleased with how powerful they are. I think yeah. that I think that when something has come into evolution, uh, it doesn't really go out. It's always there somewhere. But evolution moves on and reaches higher levels, so that we no longer uh, see these things in quite the same light as those people did. Mm -hmm. The, these things happen, yes. In, in colleges, uh, poor students get victimized and the others just think it is fun. Yes, terrible. Don, you would read? An animal in the instinctive herd, pushed by life impulses, forced by common means, each in his own kind, saw his ego's glass all serve to the aim and action of the pack, those like himself by blood or custom kin, to him for parts of his life, his adjunct selves, his personal nebulous constituent star, satellite companions of his solar eye, a master of his life's environment, a leader of a total human mass, hurting for safety, on a dangerous earth, he gathered them around him as his minor powers to make a common front against the world. Or, weak and soul on the danger of the earth as a fortress for his undefended heart, or else to heal his body's loneliness. Thank you. Anything to ask? Especially the last part, when he was weak, yeah, he, he's talking about each, each individual in such a group. No? Each of them sees himself reflected in the others. No? And they're all uh, somehow working together like a pack of animals. So there are those who are like him, either because they are uh, blood relatives, or because they belong to the same village, there's a custom, the we, this is us. No? Uh, so 
he just takes them as part of his own life. So whatever he wants for himself, he wants for them. You know? They're his adjunct selves. They're part of himself. Uh, he, he's like a, a star and they are like the stars around him. You know? So he may take a leading role. He may be a master in such a, a life environment. You know? Then he's the leader of this little mass of human beings huddling together for safety on this dangerous earth. So he tries to hold them all together, gathering him round him as if minor powers. He's the leader, but he needs their support. No? But some were not like that. They experienced life differently. They um, felt very weak and alone on an earth that doesn't care about them. So then he needs other, they need other people around them for protection, as a fortress, for his undefended heart, or just for the pleasure of company and touch and companionship. He needs them. These are the kind, this is the kind of glue that holds those groups together. Will you read? In others, then, his kind, he sends to foe, as alien, unlike force, to shun and fear. A stranger, an adversary to hate and slay, or he lived as lives a solitary brute, at war with all he bore his single fate. Absorbed in the present act, the fleeting days, none thought to look beyond the hour's gaze or dreamed to make this earth a fairer world, or felt some touch divine surprise his heart. Thank you. The gladness that the fugitive moment gave, the desire grasped the bliss, the experience won. Movement and speed and strength with joy enough, and boldly... Bodily. Bodily. Bodily, longing, shared and quarrel and play. And tears and laughter and the need called love. Yes. Okay. So there's those who are like him, but there are also others than his kind. And then he feels that something alien and threatening, a foe, an enemy, an alien, unlike force to shun and fear, a stranger and adversary to hate and slay. So those are the people who are living in groups. They're masters or weak. They have these different attitudes. But there are a few people who lived alone, like solitary animals, at war with the whole universe, at war with all. Such a, an individual has to bear his single fate all alone. That also happened. This burning for safety or a dangerous earth, yeah. is it like that to avoid the challenge that people are gathering and to avoid the danger and the challenges of everyday life of the society? Can you take it into that way or...? Well, nowadays things are a bit different. People, people don't often have to live alone, and if they do, it's for choice, by choice, you not know, deliberately separate themselves. But if we imagine these primitive people, the earth was almost empty, you know, and it was full of dangers, all kinds of dangers, wild animals, you know, weather, all kinds of unpredictable circumstances, and of course the tribe from the next valley who might come and um, want to carry you off as a slave. So for all these reasons, um, it's probably at this period that human beings became social animals, okay, as we still are today. Um, exceptionally, there are few people who uh, don't want to belong to the pack. But human beings on the whole, on the whole, are gregarious. They, they, enjoy the company of other human beings, something that they feel is necessary in one way or another. So hopefully all that has its roots back in this time of the early animal man. 
Yes, of course, there are those who, for, for various reasons, want to be alone. Yes. Lone wolves. Hmm? In German, there's a wonderful song by Schubert called Einsame, totally mm -hmm. no German. Mm -hmm. No meaning in German there, and he's just delighted to have to. <coughs> to be lonely. Be lonely. Mm -hmm. What is this need called love? Why is it? Oh well, what is love? What is what? What is that thing we call love? It's the need for companionship and uh, a partner. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a there's a level of our being where it's not more than that. It's not the true um, soul love, the divine love. But Shalom, when you know you are alone, and when you die, you are alone. Well, when you're born, normally you're with your parents. Yes. And you're with your family and your... But you, when you born... You're talking about the true individuality which is within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is, the, that is something that at this level the evolving beings were not conscious of. Of that true self within. Mm -hmm. they were, that's, he, he says they were not aware of it. And even those people who go and away from human society and are hermits or um, you know, sannyasis, they live in a cave. Uh, very often, then they or they are prisoners, perhaps they may be in solitary uh, imprisonment. Then they. They make friends even with spiders or mice, you know. <laughs> there, there's something in us which needs a companionship. As powerful beings. But um, so at this stage they have thoughts. They have thoughts. They had a notion of God. Obviously, they had some kind of notion of superior beings. And when they were powerful, then they thought, "Yes, we are. We are those superior beings, <laughs> or at least we're like them." Probably, this idea of uh, higher powers must have developed very early on. I think Mother says even. Animals, uh, they think of us as kind of gods. We, we are powerful and unpredictable and they, they, <laughs> they depend on us in some way. I, mean, she, I think she's speaking of animals that are in contact with human beings. We do unpredictable things. We never know whether they're going to be nice or nasty. Some kind of primitive idea of a, a more powerful being. But he says that um, whatever kind of social grouping they were in or not in, um, they, their consciousness was the same. They were all absorbed in the present act, fleeting days, none thought to look beyond the hour's gains. This is very much the animal consciousness. None of them are dreaming to make this earth a, a more beautiful and fairer world. And none of them feel any divine touch surprising them. So the delight, the gladness that the fugitive moment gave, just a moment's joy or the satisfaction of achieving something that's desired, that gives some bliss some experience that's one, and the enjoyment of movement and speed and strength, those things were joy enough, and bodily longings shared, and quarrel and play, and tears and laughter, and the need called love. This was life, and it is still life for most of us, no? all these kind of things for our you can say our basic animal consciousness. Fanny, would you read? In war and class, these lines are 
life movements joined the all life they can't help being connected to the life of everything whether they are fighting with wrestlings of a divided unity inflicting on each other mutual grief and happiness they are ignorant of the oneness that's joining them all so the consciousness that is prevalent at that time is a half-awakened nescience, a state of not knowing, just beginning to wake up, struggling to know using the senses, sight and touch, to know about the outside of things. And at this stage of consciousness, instinct has been formed. It's like the knowledge of a species. Certain things are, are known. Things that have been uh, learned by experience. The past is living on in the crowded sleep of memory. Not so much the memory of the individual, but the memory of the species or the race. The memory is coming up as if from a bottomless sea of knowledge. So that nescience, that power of not knowing, she turns around, inverting into half thought, the quickened sense, the knowledge that's gained through the senses. That nescience is feeling around, groping around for truth, for something that can be relied upon. So that she Nessians, I think. So oh, she's clutching to her the little she could reach and sees, and she keeps it safe in the subconscious, in the subconscious cave. Francis, you look ready? So much in your own back and forth. And right. This is the way that the dim being grow in light, in consciousness, and in force, in power. This is the way that it has to rise to one day reach its higher destiny. And through these gropings it will learn to look up to God and round up the universe. It has to learn by failure, and progress by fall, falling again and again and learning as we rise up and battle 
with this difficult environment and all the disasters that can spring on us. And in being, we'll discover his deep soul by passing through suffering and by possessing, he will grow into his own vast being, greater being, Surya. Mm -hmm. Surya is just going to read that. Halfway she stopped and found her path no more. Still nothing was achieved but to begin. Yet finished seemed to suffer her force. Only she had given out sparks of ignorance. Only the life could think and not the mind. Only the sense could feel and not the soul. Only was he some key of the theme of life, some joy to be, some rapturous leaps of sense. All was an impetus of half-conscious force. Her spirit, falling, drowned in dense life form, the vague self-grasping of the shape of things. Thank you. So this she, of course it is the Nessians, but it's the half-awakened nescience of the life consciousness at that time, at that stage of development. So Sri gives us a hint of what has to be achieved still. But this force is not able to achieve it. The circle of her force seems to be finished. So then he enumerates her achievements. She has beaten out of inert, unconscious matter some sparks of ignorance. The mind hasn't learned to think yet. Only the life could think, the life man. And only the senses, physical senses could feel. The soul hasn't yet woken up. Some heat of the flame of life, of the life energy, has been lit. That does give some joy, some rapturous leaps of sense experiences. So what is dominant at that stage is this impetus of half-conscious thought. Her spirit sprawling, drowned in dense life forms. <laughs> it kind of hasn't really got much control, no? there's so much sense experience. But that spirit is a vague self, some vague individuality, grasping, trying to work out the shape of things. That's the achievement of this stage of the animal creation. And what is behind it all, Juan? Would you read the next sentence? Behind all moved seeking for vessels to hold the first raw vintage of the grapes of God on earth's map, the spill of the supernal, supernal bliss intoxicating the stupefied soul and mind, a heavy wine of the rapture, dark and crude, dim, uncast yet into spiritual form, obscure inhabitant of the world's blind call, an unborn godhead's will, a new desire. Mm, this kind of summing all this up. Behind all this is moving an unborn godhead's will. There's a divine will of something which is yet to be born. A silent desire is impelling all this. Mm. It is seeking for vessels, for forms, to hold a first raw vintage of the grapes of God. The grapes are, of course, always the symbol of the uh, ananda. So out of that we make the wine that gives the delight. So this unborn Godhead's will, this mute desire, is seeking for vessels to hold some first raw vintage, the first rough kind of wine 
from these grapes of God. This vintage, he says, is a spilth. It's been um, poured out or spilled or overflowed onto earth's mud. But it has come from the supernal bliss. That first raw vintage is intoxicating. It must be bitter too. Sorry? It must be bitter too. <laughs> yeah, probably, yes. It's intoxicating the stupefied soul and mind. It's a heady wine. It uh, turns your head. It's dark and crude. The rapture that it gives is dark and crude. It's dim, uncast yet into spiritual form. But it is that bliss, that um, spilth of the supernal bliss is the obscure inhabitant at the very core of the world. Asvapati can see this because he can see into the heart of things. So we've seen in this canto um, two levels of life. The life that is just emerging from matter and then the life that is more dynamic, more full of energy, the life, the animal life the animal creation, and in the final uh, section, a third creation reveals its face. It's the beginning of body's early mind. The way that these three powers, matter, life, and mind, we've read in the Life Divine, that at every level of consciousness, they are present and they affect each other. So. Here, where it's the life that he's talking about, the little life, there's a the first level that is dominated by matter, by the physical, struggling to emerge. But then we see something that's really an expression of life, what we identify with life, the animal world, you know, the rajasic life level. And now he'll reveal to us a level which is still the little life, but it's one in which mind begins to have more role to play, more influence. Would you like to read? I would be delighted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the break. Yeah. A third creation now revealing this space. More of bodies early mind was made. A plant of light kindled the obscure world force. It darkened a dreaded world with a seeing idea, an arm the eye with thoughts dynamic points. A small thinking we watched the works of time. A difficult evolution from below. Call it a must intervention from above, else this great mind inconscient universe could never have disclosed its hidden mind or even its blinkered blinkers work in beast and man, the intelligence that devised the cosmic scheme. Thank you. It dowered a driven world, endowed, mm -hmm. gave to this world which is driven by impulse. It gives it the power of seeing idea and armed the act, otherwise all consciousness was expressed with through action. Hmm? But now there is some kind of dynamic point of thought, a small thinking being watched the works of time. And this has come again with the same process as this difficult evolution from below, preparing, aspiring, calling for something higher and that calls down a masked intervention from above. That intervention is not clearly seen but still it intervenes. And if there hadn't been this interaction, this great, blind, inconscient material universe could never have disclosed, revealed the mind that was hidden within it. If there hadn't been this development the intelligence 
that has devised the whole scheme of the universe could never have um, worked in animals and men, even in blinkers. Um, blinkers in the days when we had working horses in our cities, uh, they used to put blinkers on them so that they could they would only see what was in front of them and not be startled or distracted by what was on either side. So if somebody's working in blinkers, they've got tunnel vision. No? They are not seeing the whole picture yeah. mm. restricted in their vision. Yes, Don? Mm. Oh, you've got your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> To dower means to give, actually. To give. Mm -hmm. So you endow, uh, you know, trust, you put the will there. Hear, hear what does it say? It's not really to give something. For example, you say he's wearing a door, endow. That means he's wearing a door. Yeah, that's it. You've been gifted something. So this, it was, that were, um, glint of light which kindled, gave more dynamism to the world force. It dowered, it gave to, it added to this driven world um, the possibility that hadn't been there before of a seeing idea, a conscious idea, something with a purpose and a plan. Does Rand Hicks say anything about it? Um, Dowered? Yeah, um, just what I can just to say that he more or less a gift to To endow, mm. either with a dowry or with a gift mm. or power. Yeah, you can give a power, you can give a capacity. So this seeing light endows, it provides, if it enables the action of this seeing idea. Hmm. Yes. To me it suggests foreseeing. It's not just having an idea from experience that, oh, that tastes good or that hurts or something like that. But it's something that looks forward to another possibility. Or just observing and conceiving an idea of something, something that in the mind, this idea is just forming in the center. Yeah, there are different kinds of ideas, no? Mm -hmm. Seeing. Seeing, so it's, it's, it's endowed with vision. There's the possibility of looking forward. Is it an intuition? Well, intuition is of course behind all this, but I don't think it's intuition is the power that he's talking about here. No. It's just this. You think of the animal mind, no? Uh, if you live with animals, you know that they have their little ideas and their wishes and their wills and their ways that they think things should happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they don't plan. They see something happen and then they think, oh, I know what will come next. No. But you can't call it a seeing idea, I don't think. Mm. This is moving on from that purely animal consciousness to something that we would recognize as mentality. And probably we can see this if we trace um, the development of consciousness in children. You know, at what stage I mean, it's amazing, no, how, <laughs> uh, well, let's not go into that, it's too complicated. In the previous section, there was no mind. There was some mind, there was a kind of mind, yes. Not, uh, this foreseen, like not this foreseen this mind. Yeah. And he says it's a mold of body's early mind, as if uh, the body itself, maybe the brain is developing. Mm -hmm. Glint of light, just a little light, kindles, lights up the obscure world force, this world force of life. It dowered, it endowed a driven world with a seeing idea. 
and armed the act with thought's dynamic point so that the acts are not just done uh, instinctively instinct was already formed but with intention with purpose I think and observation a small thinking being watched the works of time can um, observe and draw conclusions he will tell us more about it but first he told us now how important this was this development it's happened through this difficult evolution in life from below from the subconscious but that has called in the intervention from above of a new power and if that intervention hadn't come then even in blinkers we wouldn't have been able to to work mind wouldn't have been able to work so there was a call there was a call from below does it have to be a who there's a movement from below that uh, feels the need for that it's so wonderfully described at the end of canto 3 you remember the young gods involved in sea and sky and stone so there, there was some kind of consciousness there but it was just involved in matter couldn't express itself in any way but there's this longing that oh there could be the possibility of expression and it's that longing that aspiration difficult evolution from below that enables the intervention to come and the life goddess pours down all her her beauty and her bliss and that then this is the way it happens this is what's indicated in Sri Aurobindo's symbol the higher power comes down but it gets swallowed up in the lower power mother has described it to Huta at, you know, on 29th of February 1956 she, she knew she'd opened the door and the supramental had come pouring down but she said I saw it being swallowed up by huge dark blue waves of unconsciousness but now it's there so it will emerge so that process is happening has happened at every single level of evolution that's what's being described here and now this uh, this new power has come and we are hardly aware of it and we can hardly believe in it but mother was very sure she said it's working and that world that new world is born and it will grow we can grow with it